Welcome. I'm delighted to be able to introduce Dr. Rana Mitter, who is going to be talking with us uh, today about his latest book, China's Good War, How World War II is Shaping New Nationalism. The greater understanding of China and the way in which the Chinese Communist Party uh, is directing foreign policy and thinking is of critical importance to us all. And in this book, Rana Mitter addresses that subject and challenges us with thinking about how the future may develop. He himself is extremely well known and is the director of the University of Oxford China Centre, Professor of the History and Politics of Modern China and a Fellow of St Cross College at the University. He's extremely experienced and we're delighted to have him with us today and I'd now like him to talk with us about his book. Rana, thank you. Absolutely. Thanks very much indeed, Rodri. And first of all, I want to say thank you to you for inviting me and to the Asia Scotland Institute and to all uh, the uh, um, participants in the call today. And I hope that I know that when we move on from our conversation, we'll have a chance for some Q&A. And I'm very delighted to take, you know, a wider discussion from those who joined us uh, today. I think this book, you're right, is particularly timely. I have to say that Anyone who's ever spoken to academics know that we it, that we spend far too much time actually writing uh, books, which should be probably done more more quickly. So, in a sense, it was a happy coincidence for the topic that I ended up being able to um, publish the book in the year of the seventy fifth anniversary of the uh, victory of the Allies in World War II. Uh, obviously, VE Day very important for those of us in the UK, but um, VJ Day, the victory over Japan, was also, of course, something that Britain was very involved in. And what we sometimes find ourselves forgetting is that China was also uh, very much um, uh, in, involved. Yeah, so the real motivation for this was, in a sense, I think all of us living in Britain today know that World War II as a metaphor, as an analogy, in some ways is still very much with us, whether it's the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, or whether it was Brexit, people quite often use metaphors, whether it's Dunkirk or Alamein, whatever it might be, to talk about our, our current political crisis. What I think in the West we don't understand well enough is that China does very much the same thing today. So whether you go into the corridors of international diplomacy, where, you know, Chinese foreign ministry spokesmen and women indeed are, are, are talking, or whether you look at what teenagers are playing on video games, or whether you turn on, you know, just to give one very specific example, this season's top rated TV program in China. It's a show called Autumn Cicada. It's available on YouTube with subtitles for those who want to see it, don't have to speak any, any Chinese. What they've all got common, in common is the Second World War. Diplomats talk about it these days as the founding moment of China's rise to power in the, the world. These video gamers, I'm sorry to say, are sort of uh, blasting down uh, virtual images of Japanese soldiers. And this television show that I've mentioned is set in 1941 in the run up to Pearl Harbor about Chinese Communist uh, Party spies and, and their intrigues. So the book is really looking at why this whole idea about China's participation in World War II, conflict which lasted for them eight years from 1937 to 45 with over 10 million deaths, uh, you know, 80 million refugees, a, a horrific event. Why that should still have such a huge grip on the Chinese imagination today and why it matters for us in the West to understand that. So that's really the kind of core argument and the, the core motivation for writing it. Thank you. And um... Tell, tell me how you feel that has translated into the behavior of the Chinese Communist Party at the moment under Xi, um, because it seems to have a different manifestation. And we've talked about the, the wolf warriors in, in diplomacy and elsewhere. Absolutely. I think one of the things that is most interesting, if you know where to look, is the way in which new ideas about the Second World War and China's role in it are really central. To shaping Chinese diplomacy in the present day. So to give one relatively benign example just to start with uh, that I actually experienced myself uh, earlier this year before we all got locked down and before we were all confined to quarters, uh, I was able to get to Germany for the Munich Security Conference in February where you know, a huge variety of international security issues are, are discussed and one of the, the keynote speakers was uh, Wang Yi who is the current Chinese foreign minister. And in starting his speech, which as you can imagine in the current atmosphere was about 
the hugely ten tense relationship between the United States and China. And we may well come back to that, I suspect, sooner rather than, than later. But in this context, it was very notable that the, the language that Wang Yi chose to use, or a phrase he chose to use, was that all of us, most of us Westerners sitting there in the hall, should not forget that China was not just a signatory, but the signatory to the most important international legacy of World War II, the foundation of the United Nations. In other words, and indeed, having looked into it, technically it is true that the first country to sign on the charter was indeed uh, from the, the, the Chinese delegation. Now, of course, saying this elides a whole variety of awkward historical facts. After 1949, when Chairman Mao won the civil war in China, the Chinese were actually excluded from the UN for about 27 years. So, you know, it wasn't exactly a constant presence in that organization, 22, I should say, actually. But the point is that today, by saying that China, like the United States, fought and lost blood and treasure and human lives during those terrible years of the Second World War in Asia, therefore, China today should also have a right to have a very, very shaping role in the international rules that we all play by, whether it's the UN or the WTO or the World Health Organization, which of course has been so much in the news because of the, the pandemic. The point is that today they link it very much to what, you know, in the West we call the post-1945 world order. So in other words, instead of talking about 1949, the, the Mao victory in this case, they're talking about 1945. And the flip side, just briefly, and I think, you know, we do have to address both sides, to, to be fair, is that there is sometimes, as you said, a really very assertive, very aggressive tone in terms of some of what's said, in particular with relations to Japan and some of the neighboring countries. There's often, I think, a very careless assumption in some of the Chinese language and popular culture. You, know, you can turn on TV shows that show brave Chinese soldiers mowing down, you know, hundreds of, of, of Japanese in the, these dramas. And it's trying to put in people's minds the idea, a completely false idea, that the Japan of today, which is a country that's been at peace for 75 years, you know, full member of the international community, is basically pretty similar to what it was in the 1940s. Now, historically, of course, that can't be maintained, but some of the popular culture in China around World War II does still try to make that case. Well, I'd like to focus a little bit on uh, how the Chinese, as you see it, view the criticism of them coming from the West. Um, clearly, it's probably at its strongest uh, with the Trump administration. But there is this feeling, even in the United Kingdom, that we are, as a country, sort of between a rock and a hard place. That there's a difficulty in satisfying, if you like, the desires of the Chinese and the uh, boundaries uh, drawn by the the Americans, and um, I wonder if you could you could comment on that, and also comment on the fact that there's a sort of difficulty here with the loss of face for the Chinese as to what's going on at the moment. I think that's right, Roddy. I mean, if one has to look at one particular set of ideas that I think are driving the way that China sees its relationship with the West at the moment. Well, there are two words, both becoming, beginning with D, and we're hearing them a lot. One is divergence and one is decoupling. And I think yeah. that more and more when you talk, as I do, and I think probably some others on this call do as well, to people involved with, with think tanks and foreign policy and so forth in, in, in Beijing, there's an increasing sense of resentment, but also resignation that maybe any kind of idea of a cooperation with the United States in particular is now off the table. And, and that is to some extent regardless of what happens in the US presidential election, but I'll, I'll come back to that in, 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 in a moment. In terms of the wider West, I think it's still in the balance, but the balance is tipping away from either the West wanting, I think, a particularly close relationship in various areas with China, or China being willing to put that forward. And I'm thinking of things like the, the debates, for instance, over technology, Huawei is the obvious example, but there are, there are others as well. I'd say that in many countries, including Britain and Germany, there's now an increasing wariness about getting too entangled with the technological capabilities and the political intentions of China today. So I would say that if you if you have to take a sort of medium term bet on what's going to happen in terms of China's relations with the wider world, I would expect to see a chill, not a war, but certainly a chill with much of the Western world, most notably the US, but also Western Europe, but actually a real ramping up, a revving up of China's attempts to use diplomacy, financing, and of course its technological capacities, for instance, to bring in 5G and so forth, in areas like Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Latin America, and Southeast Asia. 
In other words, the real, you know, battle, if we can use that, the battle for, uh, for, for influence and to some extent for values may not be in the West where we're sitting at all. That may already been, you know, gone by, by, by the by. It may actually be in other parts of the world where the emerging economies are really beginning to throw their weight. And that's where I think China is really focusing a lot of its attention. Now, the, the Belt and Road policy that they're pursuing, which is not only to open up communications, but also to gain access to natural resources, is an interesting thing. And to call people have commented how, in the case of Sri Lanka and other countries, uh, they're, ended up, they're ending up with a sort of a heavy debt burden as a result. Um, can you comment on Belt and Road and where you see that evolving to? Yes, I think it's a really important topic. And um, I would actually recommend uh, another book, which is coming out next year from a student of mine, in fact, uh, Ike Freiman, as also published by Harvard in 2021, called One Belt, One Road, which looks in real granular detail at what the Belt and Road Initiative is and what it isn't. And he's traveled to various countries around the world to see it from both ends of the, the spectrum, the Chinese end and the receiving end. I would say, and I think that, you know, as I say, Ike has, has looked at this in detail, so I'd certainly concur with his, his views, that there's both less than meets the eye and perhaps a fuzzier, slightly more gray rather than black and white interpretation of what's going on. So I'd say that the black and white interpretation for the West tends to be my goodness, the Chinese have all this money and they're throwing their money and their weight around to try and get all these other countries basically under their thumb. You know, they're paying for these roads and bridges. And when these folks can't pay the bills, then they seize them and they get control. Now, I think that the story actually is less centralized than that. It gives the idea, which I think is not the case, that there's, you know, sort of five guys in a room in Beijing basically coordinating this on a, on a huge map. And actually a lot of it, I think, it is more sort of improvised than one might think. First of all, a lot of what's going on under the Belt and Road Initiative was actually happening anyway. And it's basically had a sort of slick coat of paint and been rebranded. So an example of that would be the so-called China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And the China... Pakistan economic and security relationship has existed, you know, for 50 years or, or, or more. It's quite long standing. So that's basically something that's been plonked into this Belt and Road idea that was already there. But let's not deny that there are lots of places where clearly China is making new strides. And in some of those places, so let's think about some of the countries of East Africa, which is now very much within that, uh, that ambit. These are places that have often not done that much, not had that much luck in actually getting funding from any of the traditional sources, you know, Western or otherwise, for their infrastructure. If you take one country which is currently showing an 11% growth rate, I think last time I checked, Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia, for those of us in the West, you know, 30, 40 years ago was an economic disaster, humanitarian horror of famine and so forth. To think that it can get from there to being a country that now has that kind of growth rate suggests that something very interesting and important has happened. And when you go to, I mean, I haven't been, but one of our postdocs has spent a lot of time in, in Ethiopia and you know, shown us the, the evidence, you know, the metro rail system in Addis Ababa it's Chinese. The big headquarters of the African Union, which have been built there, all built with Chinese, uh, Chinese money. Admittedly, they found out that all the data from there is being sent back to Shanghai overnight, which is a bit dodgy. But, you know, you, when, you, when you take the Chinese on, you kind of know what you get. In other words, yes, some places are getting into debt. And I think in some cases, the Chinese are quite glad to have a sort of lever of influence. Let's not, you know, make them out to be mm. Pollyannas on this. Yeah. But there's also a lot of infrastructure being built, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa and East Asia, that otherwise might not be built. And we have to ask ourselves in the West, what are we doing to counter that, that rather than just complaining about the Chinese doing it? The other area that, of course, historically has been one in which the West sort of been interested in criticizing China uh, and which is current is, is that of human rights and the Uyghurs, particularly at the moment. And whilst I can imagine that the Chinese could say to the Americans, well, what about Black Lives Matter? You know, what your, your human rights uh, record's not that good. That, uh, share with us your thoughts on to what extent these criticisms of China and what's going on with the Uyghurs strikes home and concerns them. My sense at the moment is that what's going on, which looks immensely disturbing in Xinjiang, and also, of course, the Hong Kong national security law, which many people have talked about, are factors that China's uh, ruling elites, as well as the wider population, do find makes an impression because, of course, they're now projecting themselves globally. And I've written about this more than once, actually, if people like to search my columns uh, online uh, on, in the South China Morning Post, I've written about both of those, those issues uh, in those terms. 
what I think is very important and what I've tried to do is to try and put the argument back to the Chinese side in terms which might relate to something that the Chinese themselves are willing to engage with. So I'll give you an example of what I mean there. You mentioned actually the Black Lives Matter comparison. I think it's a really interesting one for this particular reason. When George Floyd was killed and when the Black Lives Matter protests, you know, swept around the, the, the world on social media and, and elsewhere, the Chinese foreign ministry actually put out tweets about it sympathizing quite rightly, I think, with the, uh, with the movement, and absolutely fair enough. But the point is that by doing that, the Chinese foreign ministry was saying, we, the Chinese foreign ministry, have a right to comment on what's happening in the United States. And actually, I think they do. I don't think that any country should be held back from commenting on what it finds disturbing in other countries. But by definition, that also means that the rest of the world, of course, has the right to comment on what's going on in China. And the comparison that I've made and will make, make here, which I, I think may be valuable in this context, is this. Global powers get treated differently from smaller ones. There are human rights abuses going on in Myanmar and you know, uh, a whole variety of countries one could, one could think of. Um, but uh, Myanmar came to mind because of the Rohingya. But yeah. Myanmar is not a world power. China is a world power and it aspires to be a world power. Its leaders have said that. So is the United States. And when you're in that position, as with the United States from the 50s onwards, you are held to a higher standard. If China wants, and it clearly does want, to be seen as a country with global influence and to be praised for that, and I think on some things like you know, climate change or uh, international infrastructure investment, China should be praised. But China also has to learn to deal with criticism of what happens in its domestic policy as well. Simply saying it's an internal matter no longer cuts the mustard. There has to be a new way for China to engage with the world, be open and talk about those issues. Let's talk about another internal matter, uh, which, of course, in a sense, the Donald Trump says it's called the, co the, the China virus, COVID-19 and the handling of that and what was going on in Wuhan. To what extent is that uh, affecting the thinking of the, the Chinese Communist Party and Xi? Six months on or seven months, whatever we want to think of it, perhaps in China, it's more like nine months. I think that there is a paradox emerging in China in terms of reactions to the COVID uh, virus. By which I mean, I think it's done actually a great deal of good internally for China's Communist Party and externally, I think it's doing quite a lot of damage to China's international image. So internally, initially back in February, March, it looked as if a lot of people were very angry about the way the virus was being handled. And I think, you know, remnants of that do still, the resentment do still remain. But overall, yeah. when you talk, and I do talk to, you know, middle class Chinese friends on video calls and so forth in China. They say, and I think they're not putting it on, that they actually feel right now that it's been controlled rather well domestically. Uh, the systems that have been put in to try and make sure the virus doesn't spread means that they can get back to some semblance of life, if not exactly normal, at least something approaching that. And they look at what's yeah. happening in other parts of the world and say, you know, you're not, it's not going as well as far as you're, uh, you're, you're concerned. So I think domestically, it's done a lot to actually uh, consolidate the sort of general level of feeling of, of relative security in China. But I think it has also given an opportunity for some very um, assertive, very confrontational diplomacy, that so-called wolf warrior diplomacy that you mentioned that has become a bit of a hallmark. And I think that it's very clear that all sides, and certainly China, are going to have to sort of pull back from this. I will say the United States, particularly under President Trump, has been, you know, stoking the fire on, on, on this as well. And I think that global pandemic politics are not the kind of things that nationalistic uh, arguments should be made on. But I think that China also, I think, you know, a lot of very thoughtful Chinese foreign policy thinkers, including current Vice Foreign Minister Fu Ying, have actually said in public, look, this may not be the best way for us to publicize ourselves overseas. We need to calm it down. So let's hope very much that that's the direction that diplomacy is going in China over, over COVID. Well, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then after that, we'll, we'll open it up through, through Doug to, the, uh, to those following on this call. I'm interested in the connection between um, the situation in Hong Kong and the perception in Taiwan that on China's list of things to do, sort out, they may be next. Is the, the situation in Hong Kong a precursor to what they intend to do with Taiwan, which of course is a much bigger nut to crack? Does that remain high on the list of priorities that China, the, the, the refreshed nation, if you like, intends to embark on? Uh, 
I think it's fair to say that China has always maintained that uh, Taiwan is an integral part of its territory and that it demands eventual unification. And for a long time, that was what was known as the 1992 consensus. I mean, by definition, it's over a quarter of a century old now, uh, in which both the government on the Taiwan side and in the mainland agreed that there was only one China, but they disagreed about which government was actually in, in charge of that. I think that clearly with the DPP in charge in, in Taiwan, it's less likely that that particular consensus, well, it's, it's frayed a great deal, I think it's fair to, uh, to say. Yeah. I still think in terms of anything that involves a kind of violent reunification, there are an awful lot of problems that China would be storing up for itself. I think, you know, no doubt the technical capacity is there, but there's a question of how you actually run, um, you know, the, the occupation of an island in that sort of uh, sort of case, and to which there's never been any very, really very clear answers. So I think it's fair to say that broadly speaking, um, the Taiwan question will continue to be one of pretty fierce diplomacy across the straits on both sides, but that both side, but that you know the mainland side in particular is going to have to find ways to essentially argue that unification is good for Taiwan and not just something that Beijing wants because it's part of its historical legacy. And this is not at all like rolling into the Sudetenland as happened in the Second World War with Nazi Germany um, at all. I can quite see that. No, well, thanks. Well, well, let's let's now we're going to go to Doug. And Doug, if you'd like to open up for other people's questions, I know there are a lot of people who've got them. Rana, thanks. I'll come back to you later. Sure. Uh, Rana, thank you. Uh, we, we have a couple of questions, but perhaps if I could start with a question. And, and in some ways, returning back to your book, um, but, but clearly from my perspective, if you look at the, uh, at the, the sort of history of the West and the US, around the globe, there are some um, things that not to be very proud of and, and you know, for the Middle East, for example. Yeah. Um, and, and, and from what I can understand, you, you know, you're, you, you're suggesting that China in some ways is, is, sees itself as a protector of the international order. Um, and they have a, a responsibility to, to, to present something which is an alternative to perhaps the, the, the US and the West perception of the world. And I just wonder, whether that's a fair assessment. And, and I wonder if you could perhaps comment on the extent to which you think that is reasonable based on a balanced view. And, and some of the recent criticism that we're seeing in, in, in the West about how China has in some ways subverted some of these multilateral organizations, WHO and WTO and things like that whether that is an unreasonable um, commentary but because of for what you know what China's trying to aspire to, to do. Excellent question Dan uh, and let me address it directly by saying there is no doubt that China is rising in terms of its influence in international institutions and in the United Nations and it's constituent bodies in, in particular. And it's now, you know, the number two paymaster in terms of plenty of those organizations too. So the amount it's putting in is very extensive. I don't think we should be, when I say we, I mean we in the West, should be surprised that China is looking to put its own rather distinctive brand of political viewpoint into these institutions. So for instance, on human rights issues, wanting to stress economic rights rather than individual civil liberties. I should say that I'm a great fan of individual civil liberties. I'm not endorsing them doing that. I'm just saying it's not surprising that if you have a very large non-democratic country that is paying that much into the system and uh, essentially getting its personnel in there, then it's not surprising that things are gonna go in that direction. And I think that a large part of the reason is an abandonment by those of us in the liberal world of those structures and you have to point your finger to some extent at the United States. We have at the moment the first president of the United States who genuinely doesn't, since World War II, who genuinely doesn't seem to believe in multilateralism. He genuinely doesn't seem to believe in international organizations. A United States and a Western Europe, you know, the rich and Japan, the, the richest countries in the world, can and should be doing more to put more money into the UN, into the World Health Organization, into all these organizations. We do actually put in more than sometimes the figures suggest. China's quite good about its own publicity and perhaps gets more publicity back than it necessarily actually puts in cash. But nonetheless, it's fair to say that the Chinese have been contributing more in areas like peacekeeping. If we think we don't like what the Chinese do, and in some areas like individual liberties, I think we should push back hard, then we need to also show that our money is where our mouth is. And right now, I think 
we're in a very dangerous place globally where international institutions are under, under heavy threat because the countries that should be upholding liberal values in those institutions are not coming up to scratch at the, uh, at the moment. I think that that's more of a case of making sure we do what we ought to do rather than blaming the Chinese for acting as you know, the Chinese quite naturally, from their point of view, want to do. Rana, thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Peter de Vink. If, um, Peter, if you're there, if you'd ask your question, please. But would you like to also very recently, I think it was this week, China said that they would be zero carbon by 2060. And, you know, if you think that every day they open a giant uh, coal-fired power station, it really sounds rather hollow that they make these promises. And I feel, is the Chinese, they have to have all their own way in everything that they are doing. And I can understand, I have some empathy with Trump, that he is pretty sick of the way that China has traded in the world. And uh, today, with this uh, ambition to become zero carbon in 2060 and opening all these coal-fired power stations, I think, you know, you really question whether they are for for, for serious, and I would love for you to comment on that. Okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for a, a very important set of questions. There, there are several questions embedded in what you, you say there. So um, on the climate change question, I think it is unquestionable that China needs to do an awful lot more, and that sometimes its left hand is not matching what its right hand is doing. So on the one hand, you know, let's, let's give the positive side, China is a world leader in terms of solar technology and is installing a whole variety of eco cities and building new ones that could well be the part of the solution to the, the question of how it becomes carbon neutral over decades. But 2060, we may not all be here by that stage and it's gonna to have to be a lot, a lot quicker than that. On the other hand, the Belt and Road Initiative, which we mentioned previously, is pushing an awful lot of coal fired power station in other countries. So even if China is not building as many of them at home as it used to do, it is sponsoring the building of them in other countries, which doesn't really help globally in those terms. I point out, though, that, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm not suggesting exact equivalence, but India and the United States are also two major polluters with very big economies, which are not doing nearly as much as they could do. And it's not China that's pulled out of the COP26 Paris Agreement. It's the United States that's uh, stepped back from there. So I don't want to make everything of what they call what, what, whateverism, you know, like, you know, if the Chinese do this, well, what about the Americans? But in this particular case, I get back to the central point, which is American leadership, which I think has been very valuable to the liberal world for you know, 75 years, is really draining away in important areas like climate change. So yes, let's blame China where it's at fault, which in many ways it is, but it's not just the Chinese. And on the other part, which is about market access, I mean, I think that that is going to become a more difficult area for the Chinese to, to, to manage for a long time. They have been able to say we're a developing country, so we can't open up our markets in the way that the rest of the world does. Now that the world's second biggest economy, although of course with a very large population, that isn't really something that the European Union and the United States are willing to hear anymore. And my own personal bet is that at some point soon, China is either going to have to retreat quite heavily into its own economy, which actually would be very economically damaging for its own people, or it's going to have to renegotiate its relationship through the WTO and elsewhere in terms of opening up its own markets much more comprehensively than it's done. But I would point out just as the last point there again, it's not China that's refusing to seek judges at the WTO appellate court, that's the United States. Thank you, very interesting. Yeah. Rhonda, thank you. We have a question from Sunil. Sunil, if you'd like to ask your question, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Doug. Thank you, Rana. Thank you, Roddy. Uh, uh, my, my name is Sunil Vulidhar Shastri. I'm a, a consultant, expert, and speaker in ocean and environmental governance. Uh, I have not had the pleasure of reading your book, Rana. Uh, so I don't know what the contents are, but uh, the title suggests China's good war. And I thought I'll take the discussion to education and research, if I may. Sure. Uh, and the tremendous amounts of investments that China is making both within, I mean, there are they they two, at least two top 25 universities in the latest world ranking, which, which are from China. Yeah. And they are sort of coaching university professors worldwide experts you know into their universities and so on and english language programs and all that 
programmed in English language. Uh, but on the other hand, through their belt, Belts and Roads Initiative, they are pumping in huge amounts of money into education in Africa. So it's not all, you know, buying up the natural resources from Africa, but also, is there some altruism there? Or is this, again, world domination or what? I mean, is there some sinister move there? But there's tremendous, I mean, there's research and education just going like nothing before. So what are your comments or thoughts on that, please? Thank you. Absolutely. Well, thanks very much uh, uh, indeed, Sunil, for an uh, excellent question. If you haven't had a chance to read the book yet, then uh, it's easily available. In, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I highly recommend that everyone that get hold of a copy and make uh, credit. That's the most educational thing that you can, you can do today. Look, you put your finger on a really important question, but also one that has, yet again, a kind of paradox within it. Yes, China is shooting up the world educational you know, uh, 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 scales, and, and it should be as well. And it's doing a lot better than uh, countries like India, uh, countries mm. uh, like Brazil, Mexico, and others, which also should be in that kind of emerging market uh, world moving, moving upwards. However, the one thing that almost all those international surveys don't mention, I think it's fascinating that they don't, is academic freedom. You're right that great Chinese universities, and I have you know, many friends and collaborators at uh, you know, Peking, Tsinghua, wherever, um, are hoovering up significant numbers of research scientists and other people too. But it's still the case that, you know, to put it uh, at its most blunt, the one place that you can't really study contemporary China in its full range is China. And that is a very, very unfortunate occurrence, you know, as I pointed out to many, many Chinese colleagues. One of the reasons that we have so many Chinese students coming to the UK and indeed also to the US and, and elsewhere is that in some ways they can look at aspects of their own country that are just too, to use the great Chinese word, sensitive to talk about uh, in, uh, in the home country. I don't think that's a sustainable position, partly because you know, I would say with a, with a piece of, uh, with, with an element of kind of what we call detached nationalism, that the best studies of China, China's contemporary politics or society or anthropology in the world today ought to be from China. You know, it's not surprising that, you know, people in China have the talent and the background and so forth to do it, to do it best. And I'm sure that one day that will, will come, but that day isn't there yet. So when you look at that question of quality, remember that it is in some ways partial, but in terms of artificial intelligence, in terms of scientific research, in terms of space technology. There's no doubt that China is now a world class actor in a way that wasn't the case 10 to 15 years ago. So there's some lessons that come from that. One is indeed uh, spend, you know, 2.4% of your national uh, GDP on R&D. Mm -hmm. And you'll find that all sorts of things. I think, you know, Brexit Britain is going to have to learn some of these sorts of, uh, of lessons uh, as well. And I, I, I hope on that front that it absolutely does. Um, and in terms of the altruism question, you know, I think this is one of those questions that's actually very hard to answer because if we think about the way in which so much international, you know, think about, well, let me, let me answer it briefly in this way because it gives a concrete example. Of all the government departments in Britain that people in China had any regard for, the one that they really rated is the one that's just been abolished, which is different, the Department for International Development. Not because, um, they have any particular regard for the British government as a whole, but because DFID was regarded, and hopefully in its new merged format still will be, as a kind of world standard of how you can actually do genuine economic development, education development, post-conflict development, in a way that isn't patronizing, isn't just sort of, you know, people from the West turning up and basically telling Africans or anyone else how to live. And, you know, the Chinese at the moment are not much better than some Europeans in terms of cultural sensitivity on these issues. So I think if there was one recent government decision that was most surprising to people in Beijing, in the policy world, it was Britain's decision to basically get rid of DFID in that, uh, uh, in that form. I think that the fact that they were so intrigued by DFID, indeed have actually called in DFID in the past to try and advise China on uh, KIDA, which is it, it, its equivalent, suggests that they too are looking to understand that mixture of how following uh, paths that suit your own foreign policy needs, but also have a genuine developmental effect, can actually be very good soft power for your country. So altruism maybe isn't quite the right word. Maybe it's more about how to do well by doing good as, uh, as they as they is. Yes, hello. Um, I was just wondering if we could just circle back to the World War II discussion at all. Because um, I'm quite interested in the point that was alluded to earlier, earlier on about the conflation between the ROC and the signatory uh, to the post-war deal, uh, which was the Republic of China, the nationalist side. Uh, 
uh, plus the CCP role in taking on the Japanese Imperial Army in World War II, which from my reading was, was rather limited. Um, I particularly reference this uh, with regards to a book written by uh, a Soviet news correspondent who was based in Yenan in 1942, um, who described a very, very limited role for the CCP and in fact alluded to some very unsavory activities that they engaged in there. He also talked a lot about the rectification campaign that went on under Mao. So I, it seemed like they were very busy with that rather than taking on the Japanese. So could, could we maybe talk a little bit about that and how that circle is squared with the current story that we're seeing? Okay, okay, sorry. So thanks very much indeed yeah, for, a, for a good question there. Um, uh, and you're talking there uh, about Peter Vladimirov, I think, the Vladimirov Diaries, the, the TASS correspondent. Um, yes, that's right, yes. That's right, yeah. So I should say, actually, I use those diaries and also Chinese materials related to them in the previous book that uh, um, uh, Roddy was kind enough to mention at the beginning, uh, China's War with Japan, which is actually uh, a kind of narrative history of China's World War II uh, experience. And uh, he does indeed make the reflections that you're, uh, uh, you're, uh, you're, you're talking about uh, there in that, um, uh, in that, in that, in that sense. Um, I think it's, it's fair to say that one of the major, what would you call it, sort of about turns, maybe not a 180 degree turn, but a kind of 90 degree turn, in terms of the way in which the Chinese Communist Party has had to readjust the story that it tells about World War II in recent years, is to incorporate the history of the Chinese nationalists, the Guomindang under Chiang Kai-shek, who it's now you know, pretty much acknowledged did the vast majority of the fighting when it came to the actual battles against the uh, the, the the Japanese, and in the in the title of the uh, of the of the book uh, China's Good War, I'm making actually an ironic reference there to the fact uh, to well, actually to a previous book that many of you may know, Studs Terkel's book The Good War, which was written about the United States in the 1980s, in which it looked at the fact that this Second World War had become a sort of fount of moral reference, a, re a kind of moral reference point for everything that had come in the post-war era, uh, in contrast, for instance, with the Vietnam War for the Americans. And I would suggest that it's become China's good war for a similar reason, that World War II provides a kind of heroic story of the nation pulling together a cross-party, nationalist, communist, all of these different groups, the, the foreigners as well, the Americans and British, fighting this, this enemy, providing a sort of moral reference point that's in stark contrast to the sort of very consumerist reality of uh, today's China. So I, I think that's one of the reasons why it's popular with them. But it does involve those difficulties of dealing with historical moments, such as the reality that the Chinese Communist Party was not in and of itself doing huge amounts of fighting other than the obviously you know very extensive guerrilla fighting of that of, of that time and the fact is still controversial to be seen in something that's actually happened within the last few weeks in china um one of the last um sort of news items as it were that gets into the book before it went to the press was the banning of a film that was released in china last year called the 800 which was a celebration or commemoration in, in fictionalized form of a real incident in 1937 where chinese nationalist soldiers guomindang soldiers fought against the um japanese in a warehouse in shanghai before you know tragically being being defeated and this film was sort of pulled the night before it was supposed to be distributed and banned for about a year because it felt that it was concentrating not enough on the communist soldiers and too much on the nationalist soldiers. But then it was released a few weeks ago in August in China because the 75th anniversary of VJ Day was felt to be a more appropriate moment for that kind of national moment of celebration that wasn't so much about communists or nationalists, but just about the Chinese. And if you keep an eye on the Chinese news, you may have seen that it has become the biggest blockbuster hit despite COVID in China in years, I think something like 300 million US dollars worth of box office being taken in, in China. So that film is an example in microcosm of how those historical difficulties around the communist role and the nationalist role in the Second World War continue to be very lively and actually you know, very politically sensitive even, even today. Um, I just wanted your opinion of educational programs such as the Shoresman Scholars uh, to increase future leaders' understanding of China. Well, thanks very much, Adil, and very kind of you to, to, to say. And I can actually say with a little bit of inside knowledge, because actually I taught as a guest lecturer for a week last year on the Schwarzman College program. I think many will know, but just very briefly to explain, this is a, a sort of philanthropic educational program set up by the American financier, Steve Schwarzman at Tsinghua University in Beijing. He paid for the building of a very lavish, very uh, impressive looking college building on the campus. 
and it takes in a cohort of, I think, a couple of hundred students a year, a mixture of Americans, Chinese, and actually students from around the world, including uh, Brits. Um, and the program is basically on sort of international relations, international business, global governance, but also about trying to create West Chinese understanding. Um, from what I've seen, it's a very rigorous program. It's very wide ranging. You get to meet an amazing range of people from around the world. And also, of course, you get to study inside a Chinese university, albeit I have to say in quite Western circumstances. The, the Schwarzman College is physically on the campus, but the courses are not necessarily shared with the main uh, uh, university. So I suggest that it's definitely a good thing to do if you can get in here, it's competitive. But if you do that, the one additional element that I'd take is make sure you take the Mandarin lessons and get off the campus and get out into the rest of the university and into Beijing beyond meeting and talking with Chinese people outside the, the, the little sort of bubble of the, of the college. So the college is great and doing wonderful work, but make sure you see the rest of China as well, because the students there are certainly encouraged to, to do that. Rana, thank you very much indeed. That's good advice. Um, we have a question from Kristen Hayward. Kristen, if you'd like to ask your question, please. You spoke of a chill um, when it comes to Sino-Western uh, relations, and I, I do feel like uh, the problem has been exacerbated by the, uh, frankly, poor leadership of uh, America right now, USA. Um, if Biden gets in, do you think there will be a change in policy, a complete U-turn, or uh, just kind of back to the Obama era, um, watching China and seeing uh, where it goes from there? Thanks, Christian. Thanks for your kind words and uh, always uh, glad to know that students are actually kind of reading some of the stuff that we churn out there. and We never know if it falls into a void or not, so glad to hear it, 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 it doesn't. Um, so one of the most important geopolitical questions at the moment, you know, if there is a President Biden, and I think that's by no means guaranteed at the uh, moment, but if there is, what would it mean? Well, at some level, I don't think it would mean anything like a 180 degree turn in terms of US policy towards China, because I think, not I think, I know, I mean, you know, I've, I've talked to plenty of people involved with different aspects of, of, of US uh, pol policy towards China in recent uh, months and years. And there is a universal feeling that engagement with China, at least in the classic sense, trying to make sure that China is you know, a responsible world actor in, in the phrase or near phrase of, of Robert Zellick, has not worked out. That China has basically become bigger, it's become stronger, but it's not really become an integrated actor in the world community. China, of course, would heartily disagree with that as an interpretation, I, I, sh I should add. But you know, I think that's shared both on Democrat and Republican uh, sides uh, in the, the US. But I think there would be a difference. And actually, I think it's a difference that China may find problematic, which is why I think, and I have no inside knowledge to do this, but I'm putting, my, putting this out there. I think that the Chinese, caught between two potential presidents, neither of whom they really want, on balance would probably go for Trump. Because although he's very unpredictable, although he's got this huge kind of, you know, laser uh, like uh, focus on trying to blame China for, for everything, in some cases justified, in other cases probably not. Nonetheless, the fact that he is so chaotic and the fact that he is, as I was saying earlier, so hostile to the structures of international society, you know, the UN or American leadership only work if America gets what it wants. It's, he's not really into really talking to allies in any meaningful sense. That's very helpful to China because it muddies the waters. I assume that a Biden presidency would be more conventional in the sense of trying to speak to allies first, not alienating Germany, not telling uh, the UK prime minister, as from all accounts, Trump did to Theresa May, that you know, he didn't think much of, uh, much of her. You know, all of these sorts of not having kind of arm wrestling contests with, with Macron. Um, you know, this sort of stuff goes down badly in the West, but it also makes Beijing think that the US is essentially not serious in terms of trying to form alliances. And I think that they would think that a Biden administration will be trying to coordinate the idea, essentially, of what the Western world, the liberal world, you might say, including Japan and other countries, considers to be its red lines. And I would say, you know, off my own bat, that there's a really important question that everyone has to answer, and which I think we haven't yet really collectively in the Western world thought our way through, which is, do we think there's a difference between what China does to itself, internal questions, human rights and so forth, 
And what China does to us, which could be, you know, questions to do with uh, international infrastructure, Chinese ownership of that, whether that's a problem, and whether these are aspects of the same question with the same level of importance. Because at the moment, there's too much of a tendency, I think, to basically list the charge sheet against China, much of which I think is highly justified, but make everything part of the same question. And I think that we're going to have to start deciding what the red lines are, what the grey lines are, and where are the areas that in the wider scale of things we feel that we, um, you know, are, are, are going to make a priority and which ones not. So, you know, that could be a very interesting conversation in which, by the way, as much as possible, I think we should be talking frankly and openly to the Chinese as well. I think they're very much part of that conversation and a frank, open and sometimes critical conversation is often, I think, the friendliest and most practical gesture you can make to a country with which you have much to talk about, but also much where there is genuine and principled disagreement. Thank you very much. Rana, thank you. Um, we have a question from Roy. Uh, I think, Roy, Roy, um, are you there? I am, and I'm not oh. muted, I hope, yes. No. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks, Doug. Hi, Rana. Um, I, I was in Edinburgh, I think I'm right in saying, when the Confucius Institute was established at the, in the second half of the noughties. I note that Oxford doesn't have one. I, where I live, Cambridge doesn't. Um, I work for the British Council. And I wondered if you had a view on the difference between a Confucius Institute and a British Council. One is regarded as a Trojan horse and has been thrown out of Sweden. Um, we seem to be treated more favourably. Um, well, the joke about the British, by the way, we've got at the moment actually a, a kind of joint enterprise, if that's the right phrase. It sounds vaguely criminal, but perhaps that's the right thing, uh, with the British Council uh, through something called the UK-China Humanities Alliance. Right, right. yes, yes. And unfortunately, slightly frozen because of the pandemic for obvious reasons, but we hope that it might revive itself at some point soon. Um, I think the difference is, and you know, I think in a sense there's no secret about this, the British Council, like most arm's length government funded institutions in the UK, and also, of course, you know, the Maison Française or the Goethe Institutes and so forth, are, as far as I'm aware, and you can correct me on this, you don't get a phone call from London say, you must push this, this and this, and you mustn't talk about X, Y and Z. I, mean, I don't know if you've had whatever, you know, kind of emails in saying you must put the words global Britain into everything that you, you, you say. But I think that even so, you know, part of what really I think makes the British Council uh, very distinctive is that it understands that educating people about Britain and understanding it all its dimensions is about talking about difficult things as well as the positive things. And actually they're all aspects of one, uh, one kind of rounded way of looking at the, uh, the country. First of all, Confucius Institutes really are language schools. I mean, they don't, I mean, it's, it's such a misleading name. They don't teach Confucianism. They don't teach anything very substantial, I don't think. And my own feeling from knowing many colleagues who, you know, are, involved with running Confucius Institutes all around the UK is that they also have not had any sense that, you know, there's a phone call coming and telling them what to do. But even if there were, then I think that there is, uh, you know, a very clear, clear understanding, A, that on the grounds of academic freedom, they would push back on this, and B, that this is something that, you know, would, would get out and become very, very well publicised. It is different, I think, from what I gather in the United States. My understanding from reading news reports is that there were significant efforts in some Confucius Institutes to try and actually inject something political into the mixture of what was going on there. I have not heard that specifically about any Confucius Institute in the UK. If you've got something specific, then you know, do let people know, I think. But my understanding is that essentially they operate as sort of language schools for people to learn Mandarin um, and you know that, the British Council is not simply an English language teaching outfit. It's a lot more than that. And its independence from government, I think, is what makes it uh, makes it distinctive. Thank you. Rana, thank you. Um, we have a question from Ling Lu. Um, if you'd like to ask your question, please. Right, Paul. Thank you. And, uh, I come from China and, uh, and uh, my, you know, when you talk about uh, this new nationalism, nationalism and it's kind of, uh, you know, unclear to me, are you talking about, because, you know, now the Chinese people are really, you know, are, they're really kind of uh, engaging in this international, um, well, they're everywhere, basically, and uh, engaging, enjoy, you know, their, yeah. uh, their international traveling or international culture, yeah. learning, yeah. stuff like that. So are you talking about in this nationalism? Could you please explain in this current situation, how would you incorporate this nationalism from, uh, you know, let's say, with, with any kind of dimension from a different political perspective, from a cultural perspective, 
or from any kind of you know ideological perspective it would be very nice to, to hear your or your discussion thank you Thank you, uh, Yuling. That's a great question. Actually, it enables me to say something really important that perhaps you know, I, I didn't get to say before, so I'll, I'll say now. Um, in, when I'm talking about China's new nationalism, as the title of this book, which is available in good bookshops, um, I'm not talking about anti-foreignism. I'm not talking about xenophobia. That is not what nationalism means in this context. What I'm talking about is the different ways in which the Chinese state and different parts of the Chinese population think about the idea of their national identity. So for instance, one of the aspects that um, I found most intriguing is to go to uh, Chongqing. Uh, where are you from in China, uh, Liu Ming? From Shandong. Shandong? Oh, okay, right, okay. So I've been to a few, Qingdao. Qingdao and Qifu and a few places uh, there. I mean, actually, Shandong is an interesting place in World War II because it has uh, some important CCP bases there as well. Yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, I think there's a phone down for the background part of this. I'll just ignore it, it'll go away. Um, so going to Chongqing, which many people will know was the temporary wartime capital of China between 1937 and 46, uh, in fact, is really interesting because as you all know, uh, Yuling, there was um, basically, uh, because it was the headquarters of the Guomindang government during that time, under Mao Zedong, it wasn't really possible to talk about that history in any kind of detail in the years of Chairman Mao, you know, because it was connected with Guomindang and that meant that, you know, it was the enemy, you couldn't talk about it at all. But that changed in a really big way from the 1980s onwards. And now if you go to Chongqing, as I've been many times, you can visit Chiang Kai-shek's old house at Huangshan, you know, Jiang Jishu, the uh, Guju. You can go to General Stilwell, the American Chief of Staff's old uh, house, which is now a museum as well. Uh, you can see also lots of commemorations of the horrific air raids and bombings, the Daohongzha, that hit Chongqing during those years. And as a result of that, what I want to show in, you know, in that part of the book is that Chongqing people are developing a very strong sense of their own local identity. You know, this is pride. At, you know, this city suffered so much and came back. But it's also part of the national identity of being Chinese. But it's different from what people maybe in Shandong or Beijing or Dongbei would feel because they have different sorts of local history to do with the war. In Dongbei, it's, you know, they invaded after the 18th September incident in 1931. It's a very different trajectory. Or in the case of Yan'an, that wartime story is much more tied to Mao Zedong and the Chinese Communist Party. Chongqing is much more about the Guomindang and that sort of history. So my point is that China has lots of different national stories about the war, but they all come together to create a much more complex sense of national identity. In other words, I'm pushing back against the idea of people who say in Beijing, they have some sort of propaganda outfit that just creates nationalism and everyone believes it. When you go to China, as you know very well, that's not true at all. Actually, people's understanding is much more nuanced and it relates to the very different ways that people relate to this very traumatic wartime history. So that's really what I've been trying to get to in terms of understanding nationalism in uh, the context of World War, uh, World War II. Thank you. Lana, thank you for that. And, and Yuling, thank you for your question, because in a way this draws all the threads together as we conclude this webinar. Uh, with a, a, a very helpful definition of nationalism uh, and its impact on different parts of, of, of China. Rana, I can't thank you enough for bringing this subject into your book to our attention. I must get onto Amazon immediately to order a copy. Um, it's a very timely um, moment, occasion, to consider China in the context of what you've written about, as we said at the beginning. And there have been some very interesting questions put by people uh, on this call, and uh, I hope you have found them equally interesting. So, on yeah. behalf of the Age Scotland Institute, who's it, who's, whose core inner mission is to educate and inspire tomorrow's leaders in Scotland and elsewhere, and increase their understanding of what's going on in within Pan Asia, of which, of course, China is a hugely important part. Uh, I can't thank you enough for today's session, and uh, on behalf of everybody who's been listening and been participating, thank you so much. Thank you, Roddy. Thank you, Doug. And thank you to everyone who tuned in today. It's, it's been a real pleasure to speak to you and hope to see you again sometime. Thank you. You bet. Bye-bye.